My dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to this session where I would like to tell you a little bit more about me and uh, about this Abdus Salam Ben Dawud or Abdus Salam Abu Hanifa as known in the Salafi sphere. I'd like to tell you more about my credentials, my dawah experience, the jobs I occupied in my life, uh, how I gained my knowledge, and why today I speak and I can criticize sheikhs and big shot sheikhs, that is, and uh, how I moved from a hardcore Salafi to a Salafi who is here to expose the distortions of Islam, the manipulations, and all that kind of... What, what, what made me change? So for me to tell you all about this and why today I am a hardcore uh, Quran pusher and why I wholeheartedly believe that the Quran is the only book that we need to succeed and gain the mercy of Allah and all the goodies that will come on judgment today and why anything on top of the Quran is actually a danger and an act of shirk. I will explain this later on. Uh, let me take you go back to the past, to the really far distant past, and uh, we start like anyone else. If you are listening to me, it means that at one point in your life, you needed a male and a female to come to this world, and that's exactly the same route I took. One day, my dad, a young man, Oh, by the way, uh, all this took place in a city called Constantine. Constantine is a city in the eastern parts of Algeria. That's where I was born. My roots are not Arabs. They are of the Amazigh. The Amazigh are the original uh, dwellers, the, the, the people that were there before the Arabs came with their armies and wars and everything to conquer our land a little bit more on this later on so the blood that runs in my veins is not an Arab uh, blood but as opposed to uh, so I am an Amazigh so in Constantine a beautiful nice uh, city it really is if you ever go to Algeria go there it's, uh, you, you enjoy your trip there so my dad, who was a kid, at that time when this took place, France was occupying Algeria. My dad was a good student and he was very extremely clever. He studied in French school, he had French papers, and so did everyone else in Algeria, but uh, he took it wholeheartedly. He wanted to be, make something out of himself especially that he saw his father, who was my grandfather, a man who's been to wars and he did not study, so he was a labor man. So he went to his father and said, Dad, I need about $80 to go and register in a college and carry on my studies. Back then, my grandfather looked at my father and he goes, no, 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 no. $80, I can marry you to a beautiful girl, just so that you, <laughs> you get an idea. Eighty dollars back in time is like your child comes today and says, uh, my mother, I need $50,000 to go to a college. You know what you can do with 50000 It's a lot of money. So it was a lot of money back then in the 40s and uh, yeah, uh, in the 60s, uh, yeah, in the 60s to, to go to uh, school with. So my father, uh, my grandfather, as was the norm back then, they look at the family, as a good lineage, a good family to marry to, into them. And my grandfather's choice ended up on my mother. My mother was a, again an Amazigh lady, red-haired uh, woman with green eyes, freckles, the, the ginger freckles on her face. And my father, a hazel-eyed person, light brown hair, and uh, so this beautiful couple that had everything to succeed got married. I don't know how long after that, a year, year and a half, and I came to the world. A uh, little after that, I don't know what happened, but they divorced. My mother went and remarried, and uh, my dad went and remarried. I didn't know that my father... So when I grew up, I saw this woman in front of me, and uh, uh, it was my mother to me. 
uh, it's just she was my stepmother. And uh, only later on in my 20s that I understood that this woman was not my mother. And of course, all the cruelty and everything that you can imagine uh, was, uh, became clear to me. So I grew up in that. This will affect me later on in my empathy and sympathy and how I dealt with people as I dealt later on to fix, uh, to work with couples and things like that. I will get back to this later. I, 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 I meant to tell you this little part about my life so that you can see how I perceive the world around me, that kids shouldn't be abused and women shouldn't be abused and all that kind of stuff. Of course, the Quran is here to support all that, but anyhow. So uh, I grew up. When I was about nine or ten years of age, my family had a big celebration, and uh, our aunts and uh, maternal, paternal, all the family, they were joking amongst themselves, and they were asking questions, uh, who would you marry, who would you marry? And I was the only kid in the family that said, I do not, I will never ever marry to an Algerian woman. Of course, that created a havoc, and I got punished for that, but that was my perception back then. This thought of mine kept on, uh, stayed with me as I grew up in that country, because as I grew up and as I realized the society around me, I felt completely not belonging to that society. I was completely different in every aspect in that thing there, and I never, ever uh, relate to or felt part of the culture that I grew up uh, in and this again will affect me later on and how I interact with the different couples as you will see later on. How I came to Islam? Well, I was in Algeria, uh, students, university and everything. I used to look at people and being an Amazigh, uh, the Amazigh we don't perceive uh, Islam as our religion, at least the youth, the older people they used to follow Islam and things like that but me, especially me, me and my part of the, uh, the world where I grew we used to think, and I always thought that Islam was the religion of the Arabs so much so that, well, yes I did hear the Adhan, but to me it was for the Arabs to go and pray, so it was their religion, not our religion, even though my grandfather was uh, Muslim, my, my, my dad wasn't until I think two or three years before his death. And uh, I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, vividly, one day I was home and stayed there and I was just kind of like uh, playing on my guitar a little bit and my dad started praying. He stood up and he put a, uh, a rug on the ground, on the floor and I was looking, it was summer and it was nice, the breeze of the afternoon. And I, and I see, and I look, I wanted to imagine this. You, you look at your dad in his shorts, uh, above the knee as usual, and relaxed, uh, as you should be in your own home. And I was looking at my dad, and he puts the rug, and, uh, and I looked at, oh, that's, that's a different rug. And I looked at my dad, and then he stood up, and he started praying. And me, I thought to myself, what is he doing? The, I'm telling you this because I want you to know how remote Islam was to me, to my family, to our culture and everything. And my dad, I remember him starting to read, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ There is too much لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ مَا أَعْبَدُتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُ There is too much of almost the same sentence is just conjugated. The time is a different tenses. And uh, my dad started <laughs> reading it, but he could never actually leave it because he got confused. When would he end? And him, أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُ قُلْ لَا أَعْبُدُ I'm going to just translate, yeah, so that you understand how my... Normally, say you, the disbelievers, uh, I do not worship what you worship, you will not worship what I, I am worship, and I shall never worship what you are worshiping, as you will never worship what I am worshiping, to you, your religion, and to me, mine. End of it. But when my dad got into this, because I knew he just memorized it, he started, say you the disbeliever, I do not believe what you believe, and you don't believe what I don't believe, neither will I ever believe in what you believe, neither should you believe in what I believe, and I don't believe what you believe, and I don't believe, and you don't believe what I believe, and I believe, no, I don't believe, 
and, it, and I was laughing because uh, I think about two, three minutes later, I just yelled at him. I said, not yelled, but you know how we talked to, uh, to dad. I said to him, dad, if an Arab was saying it, I'm sure they would have finished like 10 minutes ago. Please stop it. And then he turned to me and he says, none of your business. And he turned back to his salat and he carried on. And I will not believe what you believe. You should not believe what you believe. And then I started laughing, laughing because... And then I was watching him. He made his ruku. And I told him uh, when he was prostrating to me, that was all funny, strange. I told him, aren't you supposed to be wearing something longer than these shorts? Again, as he said down, he says to me, none of your business. All this taking place as he was performing his salat. But he didn't know better, and I didn't know better, and something was not working properly. And then he said, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum. And then he turned to me very angry. He goes, I was talking to Allah. I tell him, no, you are not talking to Allah. You are completely making a mess of, I believe, you don't believe, he shouldn't believe, I don't believe. He goes, how many times did I say it? I told him, oh, about 50 times. He goes, yeah, you're right. It should have been at least four. I said, well, there you go. And then that became the joke. Of course, my dad went on uh, to do his salat, and he did his best. He did his best. Because uh, when he was about 42 years of age, that's when he started learning Arabic. I personally uh, did all my studies in French, and Arabic was a, a session that I had to do, like you would do, for example, geography or history or some part of uh, a part of the curriculum. But it was not important. Um, uh, for, but anyhow, a little bit later. So that's that's my that's uh, the first thing about Islam. The second part where I ever interacted with Islam was one day in the classroom, and I believe I was. 12, 13 years of age, a friend of mine uh, in the classroom was trying to memorize إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَةً وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَةً This surah, when the earth uh, quakes and uh, it will scare people, and Allah is speaking about the, before the day of judgment, as the world will end, and people get scared, and they say, what's happening to the earth, and then the earth shall talk, and it shall say, I've received an order from Allah, and that's it. Uh, the, the world is uh, going to end. And uh, we were doing a math session, and him, he was uh, reading like this, and he was going like this. He was reciting, like uh, whispering but loudly. And I told him, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm memorizing uh, the Quran. I said, you're doing what? The Quran. I said, why? And because I was weak in Arabic, uh, and we didn't have an Islamic education session, so I had no clue what he was doing. Oh, he goes, uh, uh, oh, the Quran is, uh, we are Muslim. You know, he goes, because he was talking to me, assuming that uh, uh, as a Muslim, that's what you do. And I said to him, how did you, how, how, do, how, how actually, how do you know about this? And he looks at me, he goes, what, the Quran? I go, yeah, I said, how, how, how is it you know about it and I don't know about it? How is it you, you are reading it and I am not reading it? He goes, have you ever been to a mosque? Because that's where we learned. I said, I've never been there. He goes, do you want to come? And uh, my heart started beating. It's like someone now tells you, uh, do you want to come with me? I'm going to buy some drugs. See how you get panicking and you get... So to me, I was... Uh, but at the same time, it was exciting because I was going to have a new experience. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I'd love to see this, uh, uh, this thing. Of course, this is much younger. My dad was not uh, uh, back then Muslim. So to me, it's all new, part of the new discovery. So we agreed one day that uh, we would go together to the mosque and uh, see how they learn. I went with him and I remember going downstairs and I got scared because it was kind of like a, a big uh, uh, underground. It's, I was scared, uh, you know, I'd never been into a mosque for, the, and then I go into those underground and I walk with him and then suddenly we walk into a room and as I walked in, the room was a little bit dirty, it was damp, it was cold, uh, and there was uh, this man wearing a long uh, kameez, the, 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 how the Arabs dress, and he had this extremely long olive branch, he, uh, like a whip, really from far, he can whip you out with it. And because I was scared, I sat at the back, I think they were about... Uh, 
10, 15 students there. And, uh, and I sat at the back and I didn't know what to expect. So the sheikh started, and, and he was uh, singing. And the children behind him were also ch uh, chanting. And I thought, yeah, this is fun. And, uh, but I didn't know what to say. So I was going like this. But they are reciting the Quran, but I, I was just going with the melody. And then the sheikh, and the sheikh stopped suddenly, and everybody stopped, and I stopped like uh, short of going, na, 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 you know, be busted. And then the sheikh would point to somebody, and he goes, read. And the person would read. And if they made a mistake, he would whip them with that olive tree. And that is when I nearly fainted, because I saw violence for the first time to that degree, how he was hitting them. And, uh, and I said to myself, oh my God, if he asks me, I know nothing about this thing. And I just ran out from that masjid, uh, the, the mosque. I never went into one until I came to England. And that is the experience that stayed with me. Anyhow, uh, in the society, I was known as, until someone one day said to them, if this Abdul Salam it goes to paradise, I would refuse to go there. Just because I was a, an anti... Yes, they did try to call me to Islam, give me dawah, but because I was very well versed in Christianity, uh, they, they had problems because I was good at driving arguments. And my biggest argument back then is when they say Islam is a religion of truth and people... I tell them, look at the society, look how dirty you are. You lie, you fail promises, you, you, you. And you come tell me about Islam. Oh, no, no, I said, if Islam was the religion that you are saying it is, you should be in a better state. But anyway, that, that's my argument. When I was about 25 years, I decided, I, 25, 26, I decided I had had enough of Algeria and the time for me has come to leave Algeria to the West. My destination was England. Being a musician back in time, I came here to join a band and uh, I wanted to, uh, to endeavor to get into a musical uh, career. And that was working fine for me. I had an Australian manager and everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was in the last few weeks, I think two or three weeks, before leaving to Australia, uh, I auditioned to be part of a band in Australia and they accepted me. So it was all good and my manager, Mark, was from Australia, from Melbourne, uh, Australia, and everything. We, all we needed to do is fly to Australia, sign a contract, and get on uh, the job and uh, make music. So that's, that's my journey. And uh, in one of the parties, <laughs> in one of the parties, I saw my wife, and uh, who, who then later on becomes a wife. It's uh, a young lady that I have met about two, three weeks. No, nothing, no dating, nothing. It's just uh, met because she was going to be a, a, a tenant. She was going to occupy uh, one of the rooms when we leave to Australia. And in one of the parties we are playing, and I, uh, at one point I looked at her, and I said to her, just out of the blue, I don't know why I said that, but I did say to her, I said to her, hey, if you want to build a family, I'm happy to marry you. And she looks at me like, out of the blue, we, uh, we don't know each other. She goes, you're on, let's do it. And uh, we stayed married 23 years, and my children were from her. <laughs> It was an act of craziness, but that goes along with who I am, living on the edges and always do things in a manner that is not orthodox, and uh, it worked. So th that's how I got married. When we got married, she was Catholic Christian, and I was Catholic, so it was fine, but I was dissatisfied with Christianity. There was a lot of nonsense in the Bible. And so... Th so I told her, are you happy in this religion? She goes, no. I said, what about if you took a new religion? She goes, yeah, let's do it. So we did the research, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism. So we looked around. The only religion that I didn't look into was Al-Islam. Why? Because I thought I already knew about Al-Islam. Hey, and then uh, one day I told her, hey, how about if we look into Islam? She goes, I heard it, but it's, uh, she goes, the, the general things, Muslims are not good. And I said, hey, let's deal with their book, not with them. 
And that's how we went and we bought copies of the Quran in French. And uh, we read it, we read it, we read it. And the more I read the French translations, the more I was convinced that this book is different to the Bible. Both of them are translated, but the translation is different. And I said, ha, what it says here is nice. Oh, of course, of the things that, uh, and I looked at it as a book of history coming from Christian background, you know, when the Bible talks about Jesus, you see that it speaks about him historically and things like that. And I think after six months, uh, and after a discussion with my uh, wife, we decided, you know what? Yeah, let's see, let's do Islam. Okay. And then now what? Okay, we've decided to do Islam, then how do we get into it? We didn't know about you should take Shahada, things like that. We went and bought books in French about how to perform prayers and different things. So that's how we started praying. I remember the early days we used to pray in French because I didn't know the Quran, I didn't know the Fatiha. And even as I read the Fatiha, I read the, the transcribing because the Arab, my reading Arabic was extremely poor in the it's extremely 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 appalling it's like you now if you don't speak spanish and they give you spanish and they go go ahead have fun and they read it so that so i learned how to pray while reading the quran in french first and then the, the trans uh, for example alhamdulillah rabbil alamin was transcribed into the latin uh, letters and uh, in, in, to the other side the meaning of what we were reading yeah, we did that a few times, and then uh, one day I wanted a book, something about Islam in Arabic, so that my wife and I, we decided both to learn Arabic. And little did I know that this journey to look for that book would take me in a life until today, uh, preaching of Islam, things like that. I went to different bookshops here in London back in the 85, 6, 7, back in 1980, talking about the, the 20th century. And I started looking for that book, no book here, no, 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 until I landed in a place called Parsons Green. It's in Fulham area. An Islamic, it was a completely new Islamic center that they bought about six months uh, only then. It was a brand new place. I walked into it. The library was a mess. There were even rats in there because <laughs> the guy who sold books was also selling groceries. Uh, olive. Uh, he had all these Arab things. The guy was from Algeria. And uh, so I walked there and uh, when he saw me, Salam Alaikum, Alaikum Salam. And I said, uh, I'm looking for a book that explains Islam in Arabic for less than a child's level. And he laughed at me, <laughs> guess what? He don't, I said, I really don't, uh, I don't have much knowledge. And he started, I guess, how come you're Algerian, you don't know that? I said, please don't judge me, I just need a book. You don't know who I am, how I grew up, I just need that book. And he laughed at me, and uh, I think he gave me a book which I didn't understand anything in it. But hey, I bought the book. As I was going out, I saw this notice board, and I went there and started reading. And I saw that they had circles. Every Saturday they had a circle there. And I go, okay, so I can come here and learn Islam. So I went home and told my wife there, and she goes, oh, what is that? So we went there a couple of times, and uh, it was weird, really weird, because uh, there were Saudis at that time, they were giving talks of that there, and they were talking to, into the classical Arabic with the Saudi language, and my head was hurting because I was not understanding much of what they said, but hey, I started enjoying that because I was learning uh, something new, and this was the very early stages where I dipped my toes into the Salafi sect. This was back in 1987-ish, something like that. Okay, I started, uh, and then I looked at my job, and I said to my wife, then I said, you know what, I need a job where I can also learn Islam. And she goes, how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. I will look there. I will look for something. So one day we went for a picnic at uh, Regent's Park. 
uh, Baker Street, and I saw a, an, uh, on the notice board that they had an ad that they were looking for a receptionist uh, to work as a reception, and he should speak uh, at least uh, English, in the, uh, English is as a must. So I went and applied. And then uh, I had a meeting with the vice director, uh, the assistant director. And uh, he was from Saudi Arabia. So when he asked me where I was from back then, I said, I come from Algeria. Oh, he guess we have problems with Algerians. And uh, he guess I don't know. They are angry people. They are violent. They are this. And I said to him, no, it is not me. I said, I know what you mean, but that's not me. He goes, you know, you seem like a nice person and you have good qualifications, but I said, hey, you try me. Give it a couple of weeks and you'll see who I am. He goes, okay, on this basis I will. And that's how he employed me and I became a receptionist. Okay, not much knowing about Islam. It was people calling, how do I get this? Can I speak to Sheikh for X, Y, Z? And that's when I started noticing how the Sheikhs were behaving. Because in Regent's Park Mosque, the administration that runs the mosque is from Saudi Arabia because it guarantees finances and things like that. But the Islamic uh, side of it is taken care by Al-Azhar University. The sheikhs are always from Egypt. The administration is always from Saudi Arabia. That conflict exists until now and it will never because there is a hidden battle between Saudi Arabia and the Egyptian government who uses the central mosque to their ends. It's the political agendas. And I started seeing that, and I started seeing hypocrisy, and I started seeing this, and I go, huh, okay, not much has changed. So one day I decided to learn Quran, and there was one surah that I really liked the sound of. Uh, the hour has drawn near and the moon was uh, separated and things like that. And I go, oh, I like that surah. So I, start, <laughs> I started, I learned uh, uh, three, four lines and for the first time in my life, I learned something new. So I went uh, to one of the sheikhs, Egyptian sheikh, his name is Sheikh Mahmoud, I think he died now. And I said to him, yeah, sheikh, I would love to learn the Quran and memorize it. He goes, yes, it's good, uh, of course, as sheikh. So I told him, yes, um, I want to memorize this surah. He goes, good. He goes, when you recite, come and read it to me, and uh, yeah, I will help you. So me, completely out of the blue, goes and memorizes that surah, as I thought I did, because I was reading. And when I went to him and started reading it, he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm reading the Quran. He goes, that's not Quran what you read. Oh. I said, mm, I read from the book. He goes, the way you say in it is not how it should be read. And that was the first time I came in contact with the rules of reading the Quran. Oh, does it have rules? Oh, yeah, you should do this and you should do that. Oh, God. Oh. So now to learn the Quran, I had to stop and go learn how to read the Quran. And little bit by little, I found that, that I was picking up what uh, they were telling me extremely quick, just like I used to be at school. I pick up whatever they tell me very quick. And in less than a, a year or something, I had already gained on how to read the Quran, and I started digging inside the Hadith, and I started digging inside, and I was starting enjoying. To me, it was a discovery of a complete new world. At that time there, Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, you know, the singer, used to come to the Baker Street Mosque every Saturday to hold a talk there. It's called the Companion of the Mosque, where people from different, people who want to see the singer Cat Stevens, they would come there, tourists and things like that. They would sit and he would talk to them about Islam. So it was a good venue to give dawah to the non-Muslim and also to the Muslim to come and there. Uh, and uh, so one day I saw him passing by and he go, yeah, I you know, I used to sing his song. So of course a friendship uh, started with uh, Yusuf Islam, Kat Stevens, and to me he was talking music and he used to smile and he told me, oh, I've quit music. And I, t and I would ask him, you know, for that song, what chord do you play? And he would say, uh, like, he, wa he answers the question, but in the very minimalistic way, and he would say, G minor 7, that's it. 
And I go, oh, he doesn't say where, and, but anyhow, that's uh, So we became, uh, not friends, but good acquaintances, me being a receptionist, so I can make life easy for him to do his talks and him. So one day uh, I heard that they were looking for work, uh, Muslim aid with Kat Stevens were looking for a job, uh, for people to work. So I saw Yusuf Islam and said, uh, I heard that you are looking for somebody to work. He goes, yes. I said, I am interested. He said to me, well, give me your CV. I will hand it over to them and uh, yeah, we will call you for an interview. And, uh, and I said, yes. So I went and I didn't know what to put on my CV because I was fairly new and uh, my past is not something Muslim aid, it has Muslim in it. And I was far off from being the Muslim, the ideal Muslim, so I didn't know what I was expecting. I think uh, for two or three weeks I used to hide away from him Saturday. So one day he came to me, he goes, are you going to give me your CV? I said, uh, my brother Yusuf, I said, I would love to, but I don't know what to write on it. He goes, okay. He goes, I have my talk now. Sit down, he goes, even at the back of an envelope, write anything about you. And I sat there on the back of a yellow envelope, I wrote down a little bit of my information, my big titles of university graduate and things like that. And I gave it to him. A week later, they called me for an interview. I went to the interview and they told me, well, Yusuf has uh, vouched for you and he has said that you're a good person and you're going to have a job. Oh, I said, all right, thank you. And that's when I started working with Muslim Aid. As I worked for, for Muslim Aid, I was responsible for uh, an international network for orphans. Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and all these uh, poor countries, I used to manage uh, orphans in those places. That position and working with Muslim Aid and being now close to Yusuf Islam started giving me that uh, opportunity to meet important people, namely sheikhs and high figures. Uh, at times I would go with Yusuf, uh, Islam of course, to certain events. So people started looking at me different. And I grew a beard. So to look Salafi, it's very simple. Uh, to look pious, all you have to do, grow a beard, wear a long kameez and uh, don't smile and that's it. You've got your tickets to piety. And I found people starting treating me different just because I, I was in a different job. And I go, huh, okay. And that's when I decided to learn more Islam. When I went to Al-Muntada, uh, Al-Islami, every Saturday, and because of my new position, people, the administration, started looking at me different. And uh, at one point, I offered my volunteering services to them. All this was still in the 80s, at the end of the 80s, 88, 89. And uh, because I, was, uh, I started volunteering with them, uh, there were about three or four scholars, sheikhs, let's call sheikh, working until Muntada. So I was in contact, contact, uh, in constant contact with them. So, uh, and I started there seeking knowledge. Every Saturday I was reading books, I was asking them questions, I was, uh, and I suddenly I started thinking, ha, huh, my thinking process is going well, because these sheikhs from the Salafi sect, uh, are my friends and they teach me and they are, uh, I have opportunity to accede to the knowledge that other people do not have. All I need to do is knock on the door and walk with a book and say what's this and things like that. So that was that. And then one day, uh, I think about 88, 89, Al Muntada was still very young, very, very young. They wanted me to work for them. And I said, I'm already working with Yusuf Islam. They go, how about you work only Saturdays? And I said, what is my job? And they said, you translate from Arabic to English because my skills were great at um, taking the Arabic text to make it in English. Oh, I said, I would like to do that. And that's how I started now uh, having the talks of the sheikhs beforehand. And as they gave the talks, I was translating. So I was actually getting the knowledge twice because I read what the sheikhs do, I comprehend what the sheikhs do, and then I translate it and deliver it in English. And lo and behold, a year like that, and I became very good at this Islam thing. Okay, so to be a Salafi, all I have to do is do these things. And uh, slowly, 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 and then they offered me full a uh, full-time job as a da English Dawah coordinator. 
and I, my, part of my job was to organize talks in English. Back in time, in the late 80s, there weren't many people in England that preached Islam in English. And that's how I came into the scene. I started going to mosques, deliver simple talks, because back then everybody was simple. And with time I gained experience and also knowledge. And I became extremely busy at going to different parts of the London to give talks. Almost every week I had two, three talks to give. And then Islamic societies in the universities heard of me. And then uh, almost every Friday I am at the university giving khutbah and in the uh, evening giving a talk elsewhere. And that went on for two years, constant two years. And my knowledge kept growing, growing, growing. And because we have these four sheikhs with me, uh, with us in Al Muntada, I also started teaching in Al Muntada, both in English and Arabic. Because I was taking classes and my Arabic got better, and I found myself, yes, I'm good at this, and I like it. And Alhamdulillah, I. And then one day they made me the manager of the Dawah department in Al Muntada, 89, 90, 91. And that when, that's when I got the idea of, uh, here is what it is. We got in touch with one university, Jamaat al Imam in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is one of the big university, well-known university. And what we said to them is this. Look, we have students, and I, <laughs> actually it's good to, uh, that I come clean. I did the whole thing so that I study. But I couldn't say me. So I made it like it's the whole community that needed it. But really the real motivating uh, reason behind all what I did was me because I wanted something more of my Islam and I also wanted more um, uh, qualifications, more something that gives me, not uh, that validate my knowledge. So that when someone asks me, how did you get your knowledge? I can say, oh, from that university in Saudi Arabia. So it's easy than, oh, I read a book and I listened to a talk. So the agreement was with the university is that every three months, 12 weeks that is, we organize a three weeks, and sometimes four weeks, course here in London. The course teaches the curriculum in Saudi Arabia. So year one in Saudi Arabia, we, we would condense the nine months into, for us, into a 12 weeks month. So what they teach in 12 weeks, we, they, they will come here and teach it in a week or two. And then we do the exams, and by the end of the year, we should get the same qualification as a student that studied in Saudi Arabia because the exam was the same. They agreed. And that was fantastic. And then we started receiving the sheikhs. Every three months, we get about um, seven or eight sheikhs that would attend, and anyone who would like to enroll, they had to, of course, carry on the whole course and uh, people used to, uh, used to charge people five pounds back then. And uh, uh, then at each time they will give you a certificate that said you attended like that. And me, I was like a maniac, like a, an, an addicted to, to think. Year one, year two, year three, year four. So in uh, about uh, four years, you would get a degree exactly like that of Saudi Arabia. And that is how I got my knowledge is all those. Of course, at the end of the, the day, when the exams came, we did the exams, sent them to Saudi Arabia. They sent us the list of those who passed, and I passed with uh, like A++. And uh, when the time came to send us the certificates, they got into some political things, and that the government, and things like that. And I said to them, to me, the certificate doesn't mean much. Because now you've got my name, it's in there, and uh, I got the knowledge, certificate is just a piece of paper. And that's how I got my knowledge. And it was all deeply rooted in Salafism. After that, uh, as I was studying, of course, and working, I became a Salafi authority in London. 
I used to answer question in a while Al Muntada Al Islami was still holding the job of the manager of the English Dawa department. I, my, part of my job is to answer questions to, for the English speaking community in England, wherever they call us. We used to get calls from the United States, Australia, uh, Allah knows from the different parts of the world, asking questions. My job was to answer these questions. And it was such a uh, fulfilling and rewarding thing, like, Ya Allah, it's, it's beautiful to be at the service of the community. My talks in English, with times they got even better, there is a magazine, I don't know if it's still uh, produced or not, it's called the, the, the Jumu'ah magazine. Jumu'ah magazine. It started in Wisconsin, in the uh, United States, in Madison, Wisconsin. In the United I went there to their headquarters uh, for a job, and, uh, another story for later. And uh, that Jumu'ah magazine, what they did, they, I think they still, all I don't know, it's still produced by Al-Muntada Al-Islami, because later on Al-Muntada bought the rights to it and they producing it. I don't know if it's still on or not. It's been uh, such a long time. But this Jumu'ah magazine was a world-wide uh, magazine. And they used to also produce tapes. And I had my tapes uh, recorded and sold worldwide. And it was, it was nice to, uh, in France, you would hear the, my, my tapes. And it, it, it was, it, it's such a feeling. Me, who didn't know anything, and now you understand the stories about me and Islam and laughing at my dad, to actually see my tapes being sold in the United States and Australia. And written there, Abdus Salam ben Dawdur Abu Hanif, as they, as they put there. And I said, yes. And uh, also, I started a uh, monthly mag uh, newsletter called Al Manar with two other people. And I used to be the, the editor-in-chief, uh, written the, the editorials and choosing the articles and writing the English. And we would, uh, people would subscribe to it and we send them a, a newsletter to them. And that also was, it, it went on for five years, that uh, newsletter. And then it was killed by somebody else later on. But uh, in my time, uh, Al-Muntada Al-Islami, when I was there working, had reached the peak of its performance. It used to be called the the the, how do you, the International Center of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'a in the West. Everybody from the United States, Abu Amina Bilal Phillips and uh, uh, somebody called, I think, Sheikh Zaraboso, some a great celebrity sheikh back then used to pivot and come to uh, England. And I used to be in constant touch with the sheikhs, with the, the ustads, with the preachers, with all these things. There was this network of us getting together, where I'm giving a talk, I'm here. And Allah knows how many miles my car ate in England, from Swansea to Oxford to Cambridge to Canterbury to to Birmingham, Manchester, oh, Leeds, all those places. It, it was, even my children today who are grown up today, some of them had their own children, they still remember those trips that they used to go with me, uh, either at the University of Cambridge or University of Oxford or Canterbury, all those places they would go with me and assist as I gave uh, talks. So this in Al-Muntada Al-Islami. And of course, uh, at one point, uh, the administration or the people in uh, Saudi Arabia have made some bad decisions and they employed uh, someone from Iraq. This guy from Iraq was uh, an engineer, or someone who works night shifts in uh, London Underground. And from time to time, he would come as a volunteer. And I remember we used to give him uh, Al Manar newsletter to put it in envelopes, print the label, send it to people. Uh, he used to do these mundane tasks. Uh, sometimes when you have seminars, when you have uh, courses, he'd be there as a guide, as security. But the only thing that he had and I didn't have, he used to kiss, uh, how do I say it nicely? Uh, he, you know what I mean, yeah? Uh, he was a good uh, kisser of people's behinds. He was, he, and the Saudis, 
They don't care about your performance. They don't care about your religion. They don't care about anything. They just care about their loyalty to them. And because he was, yes, 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 all the time, man, me, I was the guy who would discuss everything. If they say something, I say, why is that? Do this. No, no, I, I, don't, I don't settle in easily in an argument if I'm not convinced. Then they ended up by making him the general manager of Al Muntada. And the first thing he did was he took away, uh, he stripped me off Al Manar, he stripped me off of almost everything that I was doing. And I said, Why are you doing that? And then he took it to himself. I complained to them, I said, The guy is not fit, he's not there. And of course, the, his loyalty and what they needed is there. And when I saw that, I left Al Muntada. Six months later, Al Muntada had declined and it was on its way down, down, down until today it is still down. Um, everybody is there, call it the, the nest of hypocrisy. So this is, I can tell you stories, 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 stories upon stories upon stories, uh, but I will just jump to the, uh, so I took my studies and went to the United States, uh, there where I carried on with my uh, scientific worldly uh, studies, computer science, and alhamdulillah, I don't, I'm not going to bore you uh, much with uh, what I study, how I study, what I did, but my five years uh, life in the United States gave me another angle of experience on how I should deal with Muslims worldwide, because America is different to England. And I, almost like I had to start from all afresh, and most people don't know me, so there is that apprehension. And when I talk to people, uh, they feel like I'm here to take their place. Uh, either be that in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or California, or Oakland, or wherever you go in the United States. Uh, the, the scenario is, is, is always the same. The scene is always the same. I get there, I offer my services, and as soon as they know who I am, and I tell them who I am, and I was surprised few of them would recognize me from the tapes they used to listen to. And they would say, oh, yeah, I listened to one of the tapes. Yeah, I've done that. Oh, that's my cat uh, doing their, you know, uh, the scratch to get their uh, nails. Uh, not nails there, but, you know, their paws and everything. And they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the moment they know, it, it gets like they get on the defensive. Oh, my God, this guy's going to take this. So I had some uh, really interesting experiences. When I was in England, uh, now I'm going to go back a little bit, when at the pinnacle of my performance, I also, because I used to answer questions from all kinds, one of the topics that I answered a lot was the interrelationships between husband and wives. And that's how I started working with couples, oh, ya Allah, Throughout the UK, sometimes I tell people, look, if you want me to come to Glasgow, you got to pay for the plane ticket because ain't kind of doing that. Yes, and they would do that and I would fly there to help people. Even non-Muslim couples, because some Muslims, alhamdulillah, managed to reconcile between them and with the, the guidance and the talks and the pointers and things, the couple gets better. Even non-Muslim English people would contact me. Oh, hello, this is X, Y, Z, or sometimes it's the woman. And she goes, oh, well, I heard this from my friend. And they give me a Muslim name. And I go, okay. And then they say, we have a problem if you could help. And I would help them. And few of, not few, I don't know, two or three of them even embraced Islam because of the performance and things like that. And that also gave me a perspective into the cultures of people. Until today, I remember the very first Somali people that came to England. And uh, I had said certain things to some people of them, and guess what? Later on, sometimes I meet them, and they still remember our first meetings. Well, that's, uh, another experience that I lived, and this happened in the eastern part of London, in the Whitechapel area. Whitechapel... The, the area of Whitechapel, for those of you who do not know, is filled with Bengali people, people from Bangladesh, Brick Lane, Whitechapel, and uh, oh, forgot the, the, the places. And then you go to the Mile End, and all those places, they're filled with Bengali people. If you go further up uh, beyond those places, you'll get the Pakistanis and things like that. And I used to live in the eastern parts of Whitechapel. 
near the Docklands. And uh, there I started a weekly talk in my own home. So Saturday I would go to uh, Al Muntada to give talks and or other places. So Jumas I go to universities, give my khutbas, and in the afternoon I go to different parts of masjids in Brixton and all these places, give talks. Uh, Kamaluddin from Brixton is to be a good friend of mine. I don't know what has become of him now, but uh, anyhow. And uh, so uh, so Juma daytime I give khutbas. Juma in the afternoon or in the evening I go to another masjid and give a talk and things like that. Saturday, go to Al Muntada from 12 1 until midnight or something past there with the activities, uh, Arabic translation from Arabic to English, and then my own talks that I give. And uh, it's worth mentioning that at that time, books about the life of the messenger in English didn't exist. I was the first one in the United Kingdom, at least of my own knowledge, that translated a book from Arabic to English about the life of the messenger, and I did that also uh, verbally because I used to record them, and it's a Rahiq al Maktoum, the sealed nectar, uh, which today is uh, uh, translated. But back then, uh, in the 80s and the early 90s, the translation of this book didn't exist, and I was the one who gave that, including Bukhari, a Muslim, and things like that. So when I was living in uh, East London, I started a talk in my own home, and this talk was on Sundays. So you can see how my uh, week was charged. That talk went on for five years. I had a lot of Bengali kids that used to come. Uh, uh, one English uh, man, his name is uh, Usama, and uh, we and we we used to have a tight community at that time. There, Salafism did not exist in East London. No, and and the Bengali used to hate it because they call it Wahhabism. And of course, at that time there, I became a uh, very deeply hardcore Salafi. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit more about my interaction, continuous interaction with the scholars. And, the, and also this intensified when I moved a uh, step higher and I became the head of the Dawa department in Baker Street in Regent's Park Mosque. And how I acted as a spokesperson for the Muslim community in England for two years and a half. 30 months of my life, I was the media guy for the Muslim community here. And I'll tell you a little bit more, uh, I think, in a little bit. But anyhow, so the talk I had in my home went on for five years. I covered every topic that you can think of. Jurisprudence, from prayers, zakat, hajj, uh, signs of the hours, everything. And we would record the talk, and then we would make backup tapes for people who want them. We used to give them for free. And then those tapes also were distributed in the community in Whitechapel. I had two death uh, threats uh, from the, uh, the Bengali community, and I was almost killed once in Brick Lane because of an attack on me, because they used to call, they used to call me Kafir because of how I was preaching Islam and things like that. Later on, years have passed. Sometimes when I walk now in Whitechapel, I still get people, oh, Sheikh, how are you? And I look at them and I go, uh, he goes, it's me, X, Y, Z, and I completely forget the, uh, but the, they still remember me, my talks there. Even Sheikh Abdul Qayyum, who is now one of the big imams in uh, Whitechapel, when he came in the early days, the very first talk he gave in his life was in my home. I, I, I took care of him in the early days because I took care, not I embraced him, but I'm telling you what took place. Because later on, when he became a sheikh in White Chapel Mosque, he returned the favor and he would call me to go and give a talk there. When uh, Sheikh Abdul Qayyum came to England, and uh, I felt like this is somebody that Allah had sent to me. Now, because he shares the same Salafi perspective and talks and things like that, and uh, he will help me uh, propagate the message of Salafism into the Bengali community, and he's gonna do it in Bengali. And because he spoke Arabic, and so I shared with him half of my uh, book collection library that I had at home to help him get started. A favor he never forgot. Even now when I meet him, he still reminds me of those days and how I used to take him in a car, go to the library, buy books and all these 
thanks. And yes, it was him who first introduced me to the masjid on Whitechapel. Back then, it was impossible for anyone to give a talk in that place or hold a circle if the administration doesn't agree. That place is run by Bengali. So unless you are an approved Bengali speaker, you'll never get an opportunity to talk there. But when Sheikh Abdul Qayyum became an approved imam there, slowly he infiltrated the place and started changing things like that. He had a lot of problems with people and we were there for him and trying to help him because to me it was a win-win because he's going to help me uh, propagate the Salafism there and fight this ignorance and all that kind of stuff. And later on, of course, when he took, uh, when he had a strong uh, footing in there, he started inviting me and I was the first non-Bengali speaker in white chapel place. That's, uh, that's incredible. Uh, in, in the five years where we recorded, you can take the 52 weeks, time them by five, never stopped. And that's the number of tapes we recorded and delivered and uh, sent to people. Somewhere in London, somebody has my tapes. I just don't know who that is, but uh, they have got them. I will stop here because it's the hour, and uh, then I will just jump to Regent's Park and how I ended up being the head of the Dawa department uh, in English, and uh, the conflicts, the challenges, the joys, the, the deceptions, and the interaction with the Saudi sheikhs, because that's when I started really interacting with the high caliber sheikhs like Sudais and a few other people from Saudi Arabia. There is a, lo a lot more things to tell you, so off to part two. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam, and this is about the who I am.